Good morning. I'm Len Holmes, the event organizer for this morning's presentation by the San Francisco Tour Guide Guild on the native tribes of the Bay Area. We're pleased to have our member, a former school teacher, share many of his insights in this topic. It's my pleasure to hand the virtual mic to my colleague and friend, Steve Johnson. It's all yours, Steve. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Well, besides being a member of the San Francisco Tour Guide Guild and a retired teacher, um, I'm a member of the board of the Pacific Historical Society, and I'm a guide on Alcatraz. I have a degree in U.S. history from San Francisco State University and have taught California history to young people for 30 years. Over time, I found the information about native Californians in textbooks to be distorted and inadequate. So I began to do research and talk to tribal elders about the history of their people. This presentation is an attempt to share with you some of the things I've learned about five tribes of the Bay Area. It's really best though to attend Native American events and listen to their own stories and ask them questions respectfully. At the end of this presentation, I have prepared a list of resources for your further study. So let's go ahead and get started. The largest population of native people in North America lived in the land we now call California. Scholars estimated that there were between 300,000 to 500,000 people living in the state. Prior to contact, there were about 150 different tribes living in many varied ge geographical areas. I use the word tribes to mean groups that spoke similar languages and had a similar culture. But in reality, each group was made up of small tribelets that lived independently in a specific area. These tribelets would consist of several villages with one main village where the chief resided. There were 60 different languages spoken among these tribes and Europeans were amazed at the variety and differences in these languages. A village in one area might speak a completely different language from a neighboring village 10 miles away. This leads linguists to surmise that successive waves of immigrants edged out previous occupiers of the land as seen by the Pomo and Chumash people on the coast. Though separated by miles and miles, they both spoke a similar Hokan language, but their neighbors like the Miwoks speak a Penutian language, a language also spoken by tribes in Washington state like the Yakimas. Over a long span of time, even similar languages evolved into separate ones. Today, about 30 native languages are still spoken by their people. Every tribe in California had an intimate relationship with the land and animals in their territory. From the Yurok's of the Redwood Country in the north to the Winton of the Sacramento Valley to the Pomo and Chumash people along the coast, to the Yokuts of the Delta, the Miwoks of the Central Coast and Sierra Foothills, and to the Gavianos and Mojave people of the Southern Deserts, all these people found a way to live in perfect harmony with the natural world. For thousands of years, unique in human history, they lived in a healthy, peaceful world where nature provided everything they needed. California tribes did not need to grow food such as the Navajos and Mayans. Everything they needed for food, clothing, and shelter, and tools were found all around them. While some Northern California tribes like the Yuroks and Modocs had settlements of redwood plank houses, the tribes of the Bay Area moved during the year for seasonal harvests. In the spring, they would go to where the grasses and greens were coming up. In the summer, they would collect berries, fish, and hunt game. In the fall, they would harvest acorns, buckeye, and pine nuts. Before the men went on a hunt, they would spend a day to prepare themselves physically and spiritually. They would sweat out their human scent and rub themselves with angelica leaves. They would fast, pray to the animal spirits and open themselves to the dream world, hoping an animal ally might help them in their quest. After much preparation, the hunter would find a herd of deer and begin to imitate deer behaviors while wearing a deer head. Finally, when close, he would shoot his arrow and after killing the deer, would pray to its spirit and thank it for giving its life to him. 
On return to the village, he would share the meat with his family, his relatives, and anyone in need. He himself would eat little, showing good manners to the village and to the dear spirit. Women were keepers of knowledge of the plant world. They knew every plant and its use, either for food, medicine, or for basket making. They would spend many hours preparing acorns whose tannic acid had to be removed before eating. The nuts were cracked, the seeds were pounded into a flour, and this was rinsed many times to get rid of the tannins. The acorn meal could be made into bread, soup, or cakes. The acorns could be stored through the winter for a source of protein during lean times. Oak trees were found all around California, and an acorn was a staple of, for most tribes. These are some of the common foods of data of native Californians. And as you can see, there were resources in, of many types, many types, the seeds, the nuts, the roots, the greens, and there was an abundance of game, fish, seafood, birds. In fact, when the Europeans first came to the Bay Area, they said the skies were dark with the waves and waves of birds migrating into the Bay Area. If you want to sample native Californian foods, I recommend the Ohlone Cafe in Berkeley. There you can try deer meat, a salad of hand-picked greens, seeds and berries, acorn bread, and chia seed pudding, to name a few. Unlike many modern people, native people did not see their lives separate from nature. And when I said earlier that they had an intimate relationship with nature, I meant that literally. All the plants, trees, and animals had spirits and were to be respected. The animals were their cousins and had special powers, especially coyote and bear. In this typical village scene of Bay Area tribes, we can see everything nature has provided for them. The houses were made of a willow frame with overlapping layers of tule, which is bundled so tightly it is waterproof. Meat is being dried, acorns are being prepared, fish are being caught. When it is harvest time, the village moves to a new location. For every tribe, responsibilities and taboos were known from an early age. Men do the hunting, women collect plants. The more you give away, the greater esteem you have in the village. Everyone is expected to act honorably and decently and to respect the taboos. If you don't, you cause an imbalance in the world and could bring evil to the community. If you get sick, it could be because you did something bad or an evil spirit attacked you or someone put a curse on you. If that happens, the village shaman will come to sing songs to chase away the evil or provide you with herbs to cleanse and cure you. For years, schools taught a benign history about the California missions. The Padres brought Christianity to pagans. The Spanish taught Indians about agriculture and civilization and so on. We are now going through a period of reform to tell these, the true story of the missions. While some of the Padres might have been well-intentioned and kind, the missions were basically forced labor camps and there were plenty of records of missionaries who were cruel. Indians who ran away were found, brought back and beaten. Non-mission Indians were rounded up and forced to work at the mission. The ultimate result of the missions was the death of thousands of native people, mainly due to disease, measles was a big killer, and starvation because the cattle, pigs, and sheep introduced at all the missions ate all the native grasses, roots, and acorns. Thus, many non-mission Indians eventually came to the missions rather than face starvation. This map shows the inclusion of the missions into native territory and everywhere the missions reached brought a sharp decline in native populations. The five missions in the Bay Area were Mission Santa Clara, Mission San Jose in today's city of Fremont, Mission San Francisco de Assis, otherwise known as Mission Dolores, Mission San Rafael and Mission San Francisco Solano in the town of Sonoma. By the end of the 19th century, the native population of the state had declined to approximately 15,000 people, a reduction of 
Native people had suffered even more from American immigrants who practiced genocide. Whole villages and families were wiped out, including the Yahi tribe in the mountains of Butte County. The last remaining member of that tribe, later named Ishi, came out of the mountains into Oroville in 1911, alone and starving. He was brought to the Natural History Museum in San Francisco by anthropologist Alfred Krover, where the UC Medical Center is now. Ishii was a remarkable man, going from the Stone Age to the modern age with grace and dignity, despite losing everyone he knew. His story is found in a book by Theodora, Theodora Krober, Ishii in Two Worlds, which I highly recommend. There is some good news out of all this, which is that there are tribes which have survived through the years and have maintained their language, customs, stories, and identity. Here are some Ohlone dancers at a big time gathering of native tribes in Southern California. The Pomo people um, had a, a territory that ranged from about the Russian River North to the Gualala River in Mendocino County and east to Clear Lake. Today, some of them live in rancherias, which are like many reservations of neighboring houses, and some live in cities like Cloverdale, Lakeport, and Ukiah. The Pomo people were among the finest basket makers in the world. The women could make baskets as small as a thimble and as large as a huge vase. They used sedge, willow, and redwood for their materials. Some baskets were so tightly woven that they could hold water. Indeed, some baskets were used for cooking. A basket was filled with water, ground acorns were dropped in, and a hot rock was placed in the water. A wooden tong was used to keep the rock moving so it wouldn't burn the basket. Soon you had warm, acorn mush with, an added, with added berries or honey. They also made woven hats and gift baskets adorned with feathers and shells. Native California women still make baskets today and teach others the skill. The designs are in their heads and are often passed down from mother to daughter. There are several places to see very fine California Indian baskets. The Phoebe Hearst, Phoebe Hearst was a friend of native people and purposely hired them on her estate in Pleasanton to protect them. She was very interested in cultures and donated money to UC for the museum, which is named after her. The Museum of Anthropology has a collection of some 8,000 baskets, some of which are on display. There is an ongoing dispute with the university because several tribes want their baskets back. To see more baskets, you can view them at the Museum of the American Indian in Novato, the Elka Museum, and the Kunstkamera Museum in St. Petersburg. These baskets made their way to Russia because of the Russian American Fur Company, which built Fort Ross on the north coast of the Russian River. The Russians were there to hunt sea otters for their rich fur, and they employed the Pomo people to work at the fort for which they were paid. The Russians did not attempt to convert them or to change them, so it was a more positive experience for the Pomos relatively compared to the Spanish. The Russians traded for the baskets, and fortunately many of them have been preserved at that museum in St. Petersburg. Every year there's been a big summer celebration at Fort Ross uh, up until lately, during which members of the Kashaya band of Pomos who would demonstrate one of their dances for the public. The flicker headband is composed of quills and feathers from the flicker bird and is used to hide the identity of the dancer who may be representing an animal or spirit. This headband is typical among many tribes of the North Bay. A Pomo woman once told me there were special meanings to the feathers and headband, but she could not share them with me because they were sacred. Besides the Pomos, people of Russian heritage also show up for this celebration, which will be held this year. They shared their dances, songs, and food with the public. Sometimes the Russian Orthodox Patriarch from San Francisco comes to celebrate the divine liturgy in the chapel. 
For many years, the Pomo have been working to gain access to their ancient traditional land where the plants they need for basketry and food and food is grown. Recently, they successfully negotiated with the state of California and the Saves Redwood League to get access to the beaches where they can again fish for smelt. This is the River Rock Casino owned by the Dry Creek Band of Southern Pomo, located near Geyserville in Sonoma County. In 1988, federal law allowed gaming on tribal lands as a means to self-sufficiency. Self Many Indian casinos opened, but uh, the casino industry in other states convinced the California legislature to restrict Indian casinos so as not to allow slot machines. In 1989, the people of California voted to allow Indian casinos to have slot machines by a two thirds majority. Today, 62 out of the 109 tribes in California have casinos. Some of them also include spas, resorts, RV parks, and theaters. The money they bring in is used by the tribes for healthcare, their own schools, housing, and fire protection. When the Spanish came into this area to establish a mission in San Rafael, the Miwok resisted. One of their leaders was Chief Marin, who attacked the Spanish several times until he was captured and put in detention at the mission. Later, he was baptized, learned Spanish, and became part of the mission. His companion, Quentin, was also memorialized by having a point of land named after him. Cooley Loklo is a re recreation of a Miwok village located at the Point Reyes National Seashore headquarters near Olima. It was built in the old ways by a group of anthropologists and volunteers who tried to be accurate to the smallest detail in building the structures. Here you see koshas or family dwellings made of redwood planks. However, due to the Due to the pandemic, the structures have fallen into disrepair and eventually the Park Service hopes to restore them. Here you can see up close a dwelling made of tule and willow. These would be remade every year um, and the old ones would be burned. Here's the entrance to the sweat lodge where men would gather to tell stories and prepare for the hunt by purifying themselves. With the support of the National Park Service, local Miwok and Pomo people would come every summer for a big time celebration where visitors could watch their dancing, hear their stories and try Indian fry bread. This celebration is currently postponed indefinitely. Here again is one of the Pomo dancers. Many of these folks belong to the Grattan Rancheria, which is a federally recognized tribal band for the use of both the Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok tribal members. The Grattan Casino located in Ronard Park is run by the Federated Tribe of the Miwok Grattan Rancheria. Olin Pali State Park in Novato is on the site of an ancient Miwok village. The land remained in Indian hands through the mission period, but in 1863, it was acquired by the Burdell family. Later, the family built a huge estate complete with a mansion and gardens. The land was bought by the University of San Francisco as a retreat for seminarians and then leased it out. One of the tenants was the Grateful Dead and later the place became a, a notorious hippie commune. The mansion burned down in 1969 and the property was bought by the state of California. When excavating the site, archeologists found an English sixpence coin minted in 1567, giving evidence that it was the Miwok tribe that greeted Drake in 1579. They invited him to their village and he stayed long enough to claim the land for England which had the English returned, might have changed history. What has changed is the reputation of Captain Drake. Before he was a world navigator, 
He was a slave trader in the Caribbean and responsible for transporting and selling both African and Indian slaves. Today, the Miwoks are calling for the removal of Drake's name for, from the well-known boulevard in Marin. Sir Francis Drake High School has already removed his name from their school. Today, Miwok young people who have taken advantage of education grants from the casinos are involved in healthcare, business, and teaching. Here is a graduate student, Don Hankins, working for the Forestry Service as he combines science and Indian knowledge of land management with fire to do controlled burning to help reduce the instances of huge wildfires. When the Spanish explorers came uh, initially into California, they saw huge tracts of land that had been burned. So this was, was a time honored tradition among the native people to keep the wild plants under control. If you've traveled to the beautiful hills and valleys of Napa County, you know how beautiful the area is. Imagine how beautiful it must have been for the Wapo people whose home it was. Their name is a corruption of the Spanish word guapo, which means handsome. The Wapo people were also excellent basket makers. They made good use of the abundant wildlife, deer, and fish from the Russian and Napa rivers. They were heavily impacted by the missions. An epidemic wiped out most of the population, and the 1910 census reported only 73 Wapo left, 44 of them being full-blooded. The 300 descendants of the tribe have been trying to reclaim their land. Here, Scott Gabaldon of the Wapo people views their traditional lands in Alexander Valley with his son. Senator Feinstein has consistently blocked federal recognition of his tribe. A reason might be the resistance of the powerful agricultural interests in the valley who are against any casinos and wine growing areas, although the Wapo people say that it's not their intent to build one at the present time. This is a story that is often being played out in different parts of the state. The Ohlone people lived on the San Francisco Peninsula and in the East Bay. Remember that Ohlone is a general designation similar to the term European to define people of a similar culture, but who live independently of each other. They would trade with each other and would intermarry, but each village group was distinct and masters of their own territory. We know trade with various tribes is extensive in California. For example, the Wapo might trade their obsidian from around Mount St. Helena for the clamshells of the Ramitush Ohlone of the coast. The Ohlone people were especially blessed with abundance of food from the bay, from the valleys, and from the coast. Coastal people would travel inland to gather acorns in their neighbor's territory, and as a tribute would bring them dried fish. Or their neighbors would travel over the hills to fish and bring deer as a tribute. In this village scene, we see everyone in the village occupied with daily activities, preparing acorns, smoking meat, hunting, making traps. The Ohlone were also gathered by the missions and suffered a great decline in their numbers. There are 5,700 Ohlone buried at the mission, at and around the mission building, many lying under nearby streets. Interestingly, the San Francisco mission is only one of all the 21 missions whose curator is a Native American. Andrew Galvan is a descendant of an Ohlone chief who was one of the first of his tribe to be baptized at the mission. Andrew has a degree in anthropology and is uniquely qualified to speak about the native experiences at the mission. He is purposely changing the narrative of the mission's history to reflect the Ohlone point of view. After all, it was the Ohlone who built and ran the mission. Andrew occasionally gives tours of the mission and I would highly recommend you go on one of his tours. The Ohlone in various parts of the Bay Area have managed to hold on to their customs, and here members of the Rumson Band of the Ohlone Dancers have come to the annual celebration of the Presidio in San Francisco. 
That celebration is currently on hold, but may return later this year. The Ohlones have been politically active in the re revision of history regarding the involvement of the Catholic Church, and particularly Father Sarah, and the destruction of native culture and populations. Interestingly, Andrew Galvan, whose family has remained Catholic, supported canonization, which declared Sarah a saint. He believes the Franciscans had good intentions, but had unintended bad consequences for the people. I want to end with a positive note by telling you about the Ohlone Cafe in Berkeley. It is run by two remarkable men, Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino, and they prepare native foods in their little restaurant. They go out and hunt for the meat and gather the nuts and seeds and berries and greens just like their ancestors. They have things on the menu such as duck breast topped with strawberry sauce, dandelion soup, bay nut truffles, and many more items. At every meal, they give a little language lesson, a brief history of their people, and end with the phrase, we are still here. Yes, they are still here, and we are enriched by the presence of the native people of the Bay Area. I want to give uh, credit to the following uh, people who supplied their photos uh, with permission uh, and with the institutions involved. And here are some resources that you can take advantage of if you want to take a picture of this on your computer for further reference. Um, these are the books I recommend. Um, the ones I especially recommend uh, is uh, Malcolm Margolin's book on the Ohlone Way, which is an excellent book on, the, on those people. And um, the uh, We Are the Land, The History of Native California is another uh, must read, I think. And here are some places you can visit. Um, the Cafe Ohlone, as I mentioned, and all those other places um, are starting to open up, but you really need to go to their website to find out their current situation as far as uh, events now the uh, as far as opening and as far as events go the only ones that i know will be happening this year are the fort ross summer festival in july and the stanford powwow in may uh, and again go look at the, the website for further information so i want to thank you very much for attending this presentation and uh if you have questions, you can always uh, put them on the um, on, at the end of this presentation, and I can uh, respond by email to your questions. Thank you very much, and thank you for hosting this uh, presentation, Lynn. Well, Steve, we thank you immensely for your time and effort and experience in sharing with us. I know everyone is, uh, is grateful. I'll speak for whoever is listening. And uh, we hope to um, have another presentation from you somewhere in the future. Thank you so very much. Of and course. That, wonderful. We'll close the meeting with that and uh, have a great day, have a great week, and a great year. Thank you. You bet.